Poetry in motion. This is The Color of Pomegranates. Welcome back. Welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two entertainment assistants go through the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. I'm Greg. I'm joined by my co-host, Jackie. Hello. And we're back this week. We weren't here last week. It was our first time in eight months or so since we've been doing the podcast, eight or nine months that we missed a week. But unfortunately, yes, COVID did strike. (laughs) He is doing much better. Yeah, I'm doing much better, even if my voice sounds a little nasally. And even if the post on our Instagram sounded really (laughs) solemn and dark. Doom and gloom. It was just Greg had COVID, but he's better. I'm better. (laughs) So so yeah, we're back on the list this week. We've been promising this episode for a couple weeks. (laughs) And then Xanadu happened. Olivia Newton-John passed away. So we felt like we had to do Xanadu. Mm -hmm. But we are back this week. We're back on the sight and sound list. Which number is this, Jackie? Do you know? Shit. 73? I th- no. So yeah, it's number 84. <laughs> it's another tide for 84. Amazing. So another one of these great ties. <sighs> yeah. Um, we do just want to mention that the deadline for our Criterion gift card giveaway is coming up. Uh, this episode comes out on Tuesday. If you want to enter, it's been going on for a couple weeks. If you want to enter, go to our Instagram. It's Arroyo Film Club on Instagram. That's A R R O Y O Film Club. And we have a, a a post that's tagged there that says Criterion Giveaway. It's big. You can't miss it. It's right at the top. All you have to do is be following the page and tag a friend in the comments. Yeah, and you can use the gift card to buy uh, this week's movie or pretty much most week's movies as they seem to be part of the collection. Yeah, so the cutoff for that for entry is tomorrow, which is Wednesday, the 31st, 2022. The winner will be announced next week's episode, which is September 6th. Mm. Um, We'll also, of course, DM the person, but we'll we'll give you a little shout out on the podcast too. So, Jackie, (laughs) what have you been watching this last, well, I guess two weeks? You probably have a really long list because you had COVID and you were stuck at home. But... I have been on an Isabelle Huppert binge. I saw you watch The Piano Teacher. Dude, I watched everything. Did you? I mean, no. I (laughs) I watched three. Three? Um, (laughs) Piano Teacher, obviously incredible. Uh Uh-huh. Fantastic. I mean, an instant five star for me. Instant. But I did also watch uh, La Ceremony, which I've been wanting to watch for a really long time. That's the one with her and Sandrine Bonner. That's the... Directed by Claude... Uh, Chabral, Chabral yeah. right yeah and it's really really interesting they collaborated often Isabelle Huppert and Chabral so I'm excited to watch more of their work together but this movie is a mixture of Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie and Parasite and it's Sandrine Bonaire Whoa. and Isabelle Huppert it's like it's such a weird cool interesting movie I, I wish I could describe it better it has now been like more than a week since I've seen it. So I wish it was fresher in my mind. They're fabulous together, obviously. So yeah, check it out. If you like those actresses and if you like Parasite or uh, Discreet Charm, I think you'll really like this movie. I think I have that movie in a Chabral box set that I haven't watched you should yet. Watch it. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm and excited. then I watched Things to Come, also known as L'Avenir, uh-huh. um, the Mia Hansen love film, uh, which also stars Huppert, obviously. And it is so good. You would really like it. It's like, I know this is really overused, but it's a movie that truly does sneak up on you. You know, people throw that out all the time. This movie sneaks up on you. No, it's just like you're watching all of these things that should be seemingly dramatic events, but they're not. And then it really hits you at the end why they're not, because of the nature of the whole movie and the nature of the character and the theme. And it's just a really, really lovely movie about kind of a midlife crisis, but again, not really a crisis. Like it should be, it's Isabelle Huppert and it's like all these things are happening to her, but God, it's really good. I really liked it. And then last thing I want to mention is um, a foreign affair by Billy Wilder. Oh my God. Yeah. We did that for the film club uh, a month or two ago. I loved it. It was so good. Yeah. A classic. I really needed like a 
comforting but smart funny movie and i think that billy wilder is the way to go when you're looking for something like that yeah i hadn't even heard of it before it's so good aaron who joins the podcast or who joins the film club he suggested it it's really and i hadn't heard of it it's a more under the radar billy wilder movie which is weird because it's like it shouldn't be no it's it's amazing i love yeah it's really good what have you been watching? Give me, give me a. I'm gonna give you a highlight. Give me a Spark reel, yeah. Notes version of what you've been watching. Well, right before I got COVID, I saw Twin Peaks Firewalk with me at the New Beverly, which I had not seen on a big screen before. You think that's where you got COVID? No, no, I got it from a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know I was trying to convince you to go because you have not seen any Twin Peaks, and I was trying to convince you to watch the whole series so that you could go to this movie. It didn't end up happening, but. I as soon as I I mean I've I've loved this movie for so long. David Lynch, big surprise, is one of my heroes, and I think this is my favorite David Lynch movie. Which is to say, this is one of my all time favorite movies. I actually just added it to my top four on Letterboxd. Wow! Just because I it had been up there before. I always kind of like rotate. Like yeah. Midnight Cowboy is always there, and then I kind of rotate the other three. Yeah. This had, this had been up, but then after seeing it again, I put it back on. Nice. Uh, what did you take down? God, I actually don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. What was it before? It was like singing in the rain. I might have taken down Fanny and Alexander. Oh. Which again is right up there, but it like I tend to put that one you up around the it, holidays. Yeah. You know? Uh I also saw the the Mike Lee film All or Nothing, which is kind of an under the radar one for him, which is weird because it's fantastic. Timothy Spall, Leslie Manville. Mm, so Leslie fucking Manville. good. It's so good. Holy shit. Amazing film. Um I watched both. Oh, no. I rewatched Mamma Mia. Here we go again. The sequel. <laughs> I did a child's play marathon. I've seen the first five child's play movies in the, the course of the last week. The one that has to be seen to be believed is Seed of Chucky, which is really something. I saw Written on the Wind for the first time. The Douglas mm, Sirk movie. Douglas Sirk movie. So I know I'd only seen two Sirk before this. And I know when we did Imitation of Life, I was kind of crapping on him because I didn't really like Imitation of Life, but I love All That Heaven Allows. Mm-hmm. I loved Written on the Wind. Really? Yeah. I thought it was really corny. Oh, I, I love actually it. don't like I it. I like that how much. venomous it was and yeah. just like nasty and yeah. it, it went for it. Like it was really lurid and like <laughs> uh, I did see the <laughs> souvenir sorry. part too. Yay! It was really good. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> I, I don't know which one I like better between souvenir one and souvenir two. It's it was I a like very two. It was a nice well, I can see why because she's like finally making her film in that one. And yeah. No, it was really great. Really? Did you like the ballet at the end? Oh, yeah, I loved Isn't it. Isn't it so good? It's so good. And then last, I did see the Irma Vep series on HBO Oh, you Max. watched the whole thing? I watched the whole thing. And I overall really liked it. I think I the best comparison I can come up with is Spielberg's West Side Story, where I love Asaias' original film from 1996 with Maggie Chung. And when I first heard that he was doing it again, he himself was yeah. remaking it as yeah. a series. I was like, why? yeah. Yeah. And that still kind of stands. I don't know that he really did enough new with the series uh-huh. to really justify its existence. And it's kind of funny because it's so meta and there's a stand in for him in the film, like the director. And they even go through that. They're like, well, you're making a series and you don't make series. Well, this is just like an extended film. And like, but you already did this in 96. And really? it was this indie movie. Well, this, this version's different. And I think by him thinking that it, him calling it out, I think, is like him justifying its existence, and I don't necessarily agree with that. That said, it was like really engaging, and like I watch it in a couple days. It's it's eight episodes. Alicia Vikander was pretty good in it. She's not Maggie Chung. Uh, she was no good. One's Maggie Chung. But the cast is really good. There's this German guy. I forget. He's like the main German guy in the the series. I forget the actor's name, but he was really great. But yeah, overall, it was it was good. It, and it was, again, to see TV made by like a true auteur. Right. You know, like I always take notice when someone like him, like Asaias, comes to TV. It's like, oh, shit, like that this is real. Mm-hmm. And not to sound like some pretentious snob with like, but, you know, let's let's face it. Most TV these days, despite what most other people say, I think is kind of bleak and yeah. soulless. Yeah. Um, and this, this was absolutely worth watching, but I do think at the end of the day, he didn't quite do enough new with it Mm. to really justify its existence, Right. but still worth watching. Like I wouldn't watch it again, but it was while I was watching it, I was totally into it. Okay. That's, that's fair. Yeah. I'm really fascinated by that because, and I think we've talked about this before. I feel like one of the main themes of the movie is 
about how remakes are bad yeah. unless you do it in a really interesting way that completely changes it and makes it your own. Right. Well, so it's it, like, yeah, that I feel like is why he made the TV show. But then if you're saying he didn't do enough. No, it's kind of just an extension of the film. And I think the mm. film is more potent because it's a film. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing about the series is clearly there's something about the the vampires serial from 1916 yeah. that keeps drawing him back. Yeah. And clearly it was just like, because he met Maggie Chung on the movie and they got married they got afterwards. Married, they were married yeah. for a couple of years. Yeah. And I think he just, I think he's at the point in his life and career where he like wanted to return to that time. Yeah. So there's something kind of wistful about the series, which is nice. Right. And there's a lot of kind of like, I miss Maggie Chung. Really? <laughs> yeah. But they changed her name in that. Then they recast her. Her name is like Jade something, which I felt a little weird about. And Ooh, then, recast too. The Maggie Chung character. Well, yeah, no, it's Alicia the Camp. No, no, no. So Wait, in what? the series- Maggie Ch- like the Mac- he made the movie in 96 like that's the director in the new series made the 96 movie really and they're questioning him they're like well it was an Asian actress before why is she <gasps> and he's like well I didn't want to be reminded like if I cast a Chinese actress I'd be reminded of Jade uh, oh and honestly like some of that was like a little not creepy but just like self weird self-serving that's weird so yeah, I don't. It's not like my favorite thing he's done. I still like the original film from '96 like more, and uh, yeah. It, but again, it's it's like entertaining TV, and it's like okay. engaging and stuff. And uh, is it in Paris again? Yeah, or? it is. Okay, it is. All right, now shall we get into the movie? Let's do it. From 1969, this is the color of pomegranates. In Martin. Pomegranates, also known as Sayat Nova, is a 1969 Soviet Armenian film. It was written and directed by Sergei Parajanov, cinematography by Suren Shahbazian. The film is a series of avant garde tableaus set to music and poetry depicting the life of legendary Armenian Georgian poet and troubadour Sayat Nova. The film depicts the life of the artist in stages, starting with his childhood spent at an Armenian monastery where he received his education. He goes on to be an artist in the Georgian king's court, where he falls in love with the king's sister, Princess Anna. Their love is doomed due to their differences in class status, and Sayat Nova tries to find solace by joining the church as a monk. While there, he remains tempted by the corporeal world and his previous life, nearly falling in love with a nun when he is sent to collect a shroud for the burial of the Catholicos. Sayat Nova's death in the film is depicted as a symbolic shedding of the tribulations of the world, finding spiritual peace and ending on an image of the poet's muse. That's like the best summary I could come up with for a movie with like pretty much no discernible plot. It's better than I could do. (laughs) The film stars Sofiko Cirelli in multiple roles. Uh, She plays the poet as a youth, the poet's love, the poet's muse, Melkon Alexanian as the poet as a child, Vilen Galistian as the poet in the cloister, and Grigori Gegechkori as the poet as an old man. The film was shot at several historic sites in Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. The Sanahin Monastery and the Hakpat Monasteries in Lori, Armenia, are the sites where Sayat Nova actually studied as a child and as a monk in that order. This was shot on location. So the reason for the two titles of the movie is that it was originally supposed to be called Sayat Nova. However, Soviet censors felt that the film was too avant-garde to be associated with the poet Sayat Nova. And basically that it didn't tell people enough about the life of Sayat Nova to be called that, which is weird but i mean i guess i i don't know they wanted something very literal yeah so 
the censors had a problem with the formalism of the film. They felt it was anti-Soviet to be so formal and uneducational for viewers. Uh, the film draws heavily on the individualism of Armenia, which was also a no-no during Soviet times. And obviously the importance of the church, which is which was a big no-no. Uh, the original version was denied distribution outside of Armenia, and it was only when... Sergei Yutkevich recut the film and included Russian language chapter titles that it was that it received a limited release in the Soviet Union. Mm. In 1982, it was released internationally and in 2014. But that internationally released one was the recut version that got rid of a lot of like the church stuff and the very specific. How crazy too! that was like 13 years after it was released. Right. (laughs) I know. Yeah. And, but in 2014, uh, 2014, Martin Scorsese's film foundation restored the film back to Parajanov's original vision. Gotta love Marty. You, yeah. He's so great. I mean, come on, even despite what you might think of him as a filmmaker. No. His I, his yeah. work as a film scholar and I preservationist. I worship that about him. I mean, him. he's he's truly put all of his resources to yes. like the best possible and use. And I love that. I yeah. love that. Because of his unconventional tendencies and his apparent bisexuality, in 1973, Parajanov was sentenced to 5 years of prison, and he was falsely charged with the rape of a party member. But Tarkovsky wrote a letter pleading for his release, and other artists also advocated for his release during the time. Robert De Niro, Francis Ford Coppola, Scorsese, Bunuel, Fellini, Antonioni, Godard, Marcello. Can you imagine? Yeah, and Yves <laughs> Saint Laurent. <laughs> oh my God. Isn't that crazy? Imagine all those people writing on your behalf. Right. Like, and Parajanov nuts. loved Tarkovsky. Like, he said that Ivan's Childhood is the movie that really, like, made him want to give up his like plain old filmmaking ways and do something crazy. There's a lot of connective tissue between the two filmmakers. Yeah. Watching this, it's hard not to think of Tarkovsky. Yeah. Uh, Lady Gaga's video for her song 911 yeah. is heavily inspired <laughs> by the film. She crashes a bike. Have you seen it? Yeah. She crashes a bike in front of the Armenian Film Festival. And that's why she has this weird dream right. of this movie. I guess that's one way to do it. That's it's one way so to frame funny. it. It's yeah. It's actually hilarious. And I should shout out the music is composed by Tigran Mansurian. And it's a combination of Sayat Nova's music it also has some gomidas in it. It just is this beautiful score of a mixture of different Armenian artists. There's Georgian music in it as well. Wait, what yeah. is gomidas? Just curious. Gomidas is the Armenian music icon. He was an ordained priest who decided to become an ethnomusicologist and he traveled throughout all the villages. It was like the start of the... 20th century oh okay uh and he traveled to a bunch of villages and collected folk music like actually wrote it down and preserved it it was right before the genocide so if he didn't do that like there would be no armenian folk music alive today wow so he is like the hero of armenian music it's really sad too the reason that he's so remembered and revered first of all he had like an incredible beautiful voice and he composed his own work too there's one record of him that he recorded in paris And it's just, it's so, so beautiful. But he actually spent the later part of his life in a mental institution in Paris because of the genocide. He was arrested. He didn't really go through that much, which is why he's so fascinating. Like he was actually sent home where he saw like, he didn't see anyone die. That's the thing. That's why he's so fascinating. But just like being surrounded by it, witnessing it, he lost his mind. Right. So he's really like a hero. Wow. But yeah, so his music is featured in the movie and it I'll talk about it more later, but very, oh, cool. very nice. That's all I have for specs. I think you covered that was like a really, covered it. That yeah. was a really extensive Gomidas biography, but it's just because I love him. Like I'm a No, yeah, him. yeah. I hadn't heard of him, so now I appreciate the context. What are your initial thoughts? Is it possible to have initial thoughts? Is it? I actually don't know. I, I this is my so. second time seeing this. I'd seen this once before, maybe five years ago. Um, shout out to my friend Ben. My friend Ben and I, our girlfriends were off doing something and we're like, hey, let's watch a movie. And we're just like browsing <laughs> the Criterion channel. And I had no idea what this was. I didn't know Parajanov. Like this was completely blind for me. I didn't know. Like... I didn't know anything. So we just started it. And of course, it's like very arresting. It's very Mm -hmm. visually arresting. And I was totally taken, swept up in like the visual, just the tableaus and like the, it's, it's just, it's very striking. 
and very like uh i don't want to say immersive it's immersive in its own way but just the, the way that it kind of like overtakes you and but i knew later and i was like i have no idea what i just saw <laughs> Um, so yeah, this was my second time seeing the film and luckily was able to do a little bit of reading into it this time before I watched it and who he was and his life and sort of knowing, okay, like this is who he was, this is what he did. And this is kind of what the film is portraying. And yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's an incredible, there's, there's nothing quite like this. And I think the, the magic of this film is that it's able to, I almost feel like I'm not even qualified to talk about this movie. And I, I almost don't even want to pretend to know what I'm talking about. Cause like from a cultural standpoint, from a, like, I, I feel like such an outsider just in terms of like talking about this film. But what I do know is it, it, it's the fullest it's using cinema to its fullest extent to, as we said in the beginning, poetry in motion. And it just has this no go ahead no it's just like it's its own grammar it's its own world and like way of making a movie yeah and i think it can be off-putting when you first see it i I, the first time i saw it i was slightly off but until you sort of fall into its rhythm and you're like i think it takes a while for this movie to like work its spell on you especially that first time because (laughs) it's totally the kind of movie you would this is like an art installation in a museum right like you'd be in a museum and this would be playing in one of those like side rooms and you'd see like a few minutes of it and you'd walk out but i think yeah i mean it's it is its own grammar and it is it's just it's so rich with i mean again it's to to talk about this movie is intimidating because everything means something yeah and every (laughs) everything from a visual standpoint is so deliberate and it's like there's so much kind of happening in each frame that like you could really just take each frame, each shot composition and just be like, OK, this in the background is this. This yeah. in the foreground is this. So I I can't really profess to like understand this film or really like get the film besides knowing what it's trying to do and the story that it's trying to tell. But I do know that the experience of watching it is like a very arresting one. Right. Kind of hypnotic too. It I know we, we throw that word start. around. Yeah. yeah, no, but it tells you in the start, like this is not, this is not a biography. This right. is not trying to tell what happened in this person's life. It's just, you know what it's it is. literally <laughs> showing you how he felt and how he like, where his inspiration came from. And you're just in his mind the whole time. You know what it is? It's really like, as if, if Disneyland made a ride about his life. Yeah. It's like each tableau is like a different room. Exactly. And it's a small world. Exactly. This would make a great ride. <laughs> it would make a great ride. I kind of wish it existed. Would you have live actors or would you have animatronics? Oh, an- animatronics. Anyway. <laughs> my, I don't know if we talked about this before, but one of my, like, as a kid too, this was a big thing of mine of like, a theme park should exist where each ride is like. It's an art is installation. A, it's an art installation, yeah. And they're kind of starting, you know that company Meow Wolf? No. Oh, they have one in Vegas. It's incredible. What is it? I went to it last year. So it's this company. They have a few locations throughout the U.S., but it's called Meow Wolf. And they're basically these interactive art pieces where different artists design different rooms. And the one in Vegas is called like Omega Mart. And it starts as this grocery store, but everything's like a little weird. Yeah. And there's all these different entrances. And there's all these different sort of sensory experiences and lights and shadows and music like okay. beach house did or some original music i think brian eno did some original music okay and anyway long-winded point of saying they started doing dark rides and it's like in santa fe is like the nearest one that's why i haven't been yet but that's like that's what i always dreamed about is like doing a dark ride but like as an art piece that's so cool and yeah this movie does this would make a great one. it would make a great one yeah oh my god yeah i have not been on it but i know that in epcot there's a ride called spaceship earth yeah and it's like about the dawn of man i think and it's like using tools throughout the ages and it goes all through the future i think i don't i've never i've only seen videos but it seems like this could exist you know like this is his life and like here you go and it's like a series of maybe we've just like seriously insulted i've insulted some people by saying that that why it's like a you know, theme park ride. No, but it is. It's an experience. I think you have to understand too that the both of us, I'm talking to listeners, the both of us hold dark rides <laughs> in a very high esteem. Like a great, like Pirates of the Caribbean or the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland, those are great works of art. They are. And I hold them up there with like, you know, some of the great the films. The Mona Lisa. Yeah. Oh, 
a hundred percent. So yeah, by me saying that I'm, you know, that's <laughs> anyway, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I mean, let's hear your initial thoughts. This, oh this wasn't your first time, right? No, it wasn't my first time. This movie is, so I obviously am Armenian and growing up here, no one ever talked about Armenian cinema. It was always literature. It was poetry. It was music. It was opera. Those are the big Armenian cultural aspects that they teach you and that you're supposed to learn and that you're surrounded by. No one talked about movies. Like I didn't even know that there was a national cinema center until like two years ago. I didn't know about this movie. I, I went to Armenia in, when I was 17, I went on a class trip. We went to the Parajanov Museum and I had no idea who he was. I had never heard of this movie. I never heard of him. So just like two years ago, I finally sat down and I watched this movie. And the fact that it exists, the fact that it's on the list, the fact that it's so revered is nothing short to miraculous to me because... Like the fact that Marty Scorsese knows what this movie is and restored it <laughs> means the world to me. It makes me so happy because growing up, if you grow up in an Armenian household, you you have this burden on you to tell people what Armenia is because we're so invisible and we're so small and we're constantly in danger of disappearing. So yeah, I treasure this movie and I treasure that there's an Armenian movie on the list and that it's so beautiful and that it's the symbol of Armenian cinema. I don't think any other movie compares and I'm glad the world agrees. I really am. I feel like I, I told you this before. I feel super nervous and responsible for this episode because <laughs> of what I just said. Like you're always told like, you know, you got to spread the word. And so like, here I am trying to spread the word. And it's really, it's nerve wracking, truly. All that aside though, I think that this movie is such an ethereal experience. You have to see it twice, like absolutely twice. Mm -hmm. The first time you sit down, I think you should just try to get lost in it. Well, actually this was what happened with me. The first time I saw it, I tried to dissect it, like really dissect it. And I watched it too, like I watched it and then I watched it immediately the next day. And again, I was like trying to dissect it. This time when I sat down, I was like, okay, like now I'm going to enjoy. Let it wash and I over did. You. And yeah. I, and it really, it really did wash over me. And uh, there's this great video essay. It's on the Criterion channel. It also is on the disc if you have the disc. It's by James Stefan, who seems to be like the Parajanov scholar. And he, it's like 40 minutes long. And it is so informative. It's so great. Like, listen, I... I know who Sayat Nova is because of school and like, like I said, I, I was surrounded by this, but that didn't really help me that much. The first time I watched this, I was just as lost as most people. Like, it's just little things like, yeah, you know about like the Persian invasion and you know that he was a poet, but I didn't know he was like in court and fell in love with this princess. So that, that essay truly, it's, it's great. And yeah, I just love the opening card. I love how he tells you that this is not the the purpose was not to recreate the poet's life, but to just like enter his world. And I think that that is just like so innovative and cool. And I just think Parajanov is was like the coolest guy ever. And yeah, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a lot, but this movie is truly like I just feel like Especially after watching that video essay, I'm telling you, you got to see it because yeah. it's really, really good. I watched the video essay and then I watched the movie like pretty much all over again. I forwarded a few things, but yeah. I That's just, great. It's a nice digestible length too. It's like an hour and 20 minutes. It's an minutes. hour and 20. I can't imagine it being any longer. No. Um, yeah. So to tell us a little bit more about the director, Sergei Parajanov, we actually had the chance to sit down with Anahit Mikhailian, who is the director of the Parajanov Museum in Yerevan. And we'll play a snippet of that right now. Uh, I want to uh, first uh, introduce him as a person, uh, where he was born, his um, uh, studies years. Um, he was born in... Tbilisi, but in an Armenian family. It was in 1924. His family was very eccentric. His father, his mother, uh, they, uh, his father sold antiques. 
and the things. Yes. So he was born surrounding that kind of things. His uh, eyes, he um, uh, it was for him was usual to see that kind of beautiful things all of his life. He was surrounding beautiful things, old fashioned things, and this gave him a source to create. All these things we can uh, watch in his movies, all these things we can see in his uh, art pieces, uh, for example, in his collages. Uh, family, um, family's life it was eccentric, artistic, his mother, uh, they say that Sergei Parajanov inherited from his mother. With her uh, friends, they uh, they make made like a, a little uh, performances. Sergei Parajanov was there. He saw all, all these things. Uh, they decorated heads uh, and all these things. Then I want to say that which Sergei Parajanov saw from his, uh, in his childhood, he gave us with his art pieces. Yeah. I love that. Starting from his family, then uh, from the uh, city where he was born. Mm -hmm. Like uh, he written back all the things which he saw from his childhood. Right. I love that. I know it's the movie's full of it. You can tell just by watching the movie. And you can tell how much he, he valued childhood because of how much of Sayanova's childhood is in the movie. We can say that um, we can do parallel among Parajanov and Sayatnova uh -huh. uh, because Sergei Parajanov was, was Armenian but was born in Georgia, like Say, uh, Sayatnova. Uh -huh. He made movies uh, about, uh, about Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, a uh, Muslim movie. Sayatnova um, uh, was written songs, uh, Armenian, Georgian, and Azarian uh, languages using. We can make a parallel. Uh, yes. And it's, it's like the same uh, uh, person, but different era. <laughs> right, yeah. Was he religious at all? Do you know, was he was lived in a, a period of atheism. Of atheism. Mm -hmm. It was difficult to say that he was religious or not. Right. Uh, in his art pieces, we can see uh, many, many things which he made, but he liked I, um, icons. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because his father sold. He knew the value of icons. Right. Because it's also sold. And <clears throat> there are many works, collages, installations where he used uh, icons, uh, face or a uh, piece of icons or face of. Uh, uh, Virgin uh, Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that he was religious, but he made like a protest of the Soviet uh, period. It was more of a protest against the atheism, uh, atheism uh, in uh, Soviet uh, Union. Yes. Right. But uh, oh, that's interesting. Like, uh, all Christians, uh, they are religious. He was also. Right. Yeah. Mm. Because the church has placed such a big part in the movie. So yeah. that's why we were the wondering. Life. Yeah, you know, of course. The yeah. Life, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> government. <laughs> it was when we had a government, ch uh, church was a government of uh, the head of the government say, of our country. That's why uh, we, we are religious. So. Government and education and culture is just all centered around the church. Education at the same period was uh, 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 anti-religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, his uh, family and uh, the environment where he was lived uh, was religious. Yes. Um, so when he was imprisoned, I know that he made art pieces in prison. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think the museum has a lot of them. Yes, we had a lot of uh, art pieces. Oh. Uh, he spent four bad years in Ukrainian different camps uh, from 1963 to 96. Uh, sorry, from 1973 to 1977. Mm -hmm. He was accused of homosexuality, mm -hmm. but reason was his speech. In 1971, he was invited to Belarus to screen his Sayat Nova movie. Uh, before the screening, they had some problems with electricity. And that period, Sergei Parajan made a speech. 
mm-hmm. where he, he criticized whole Soviet Union film industry. He was, um, I want to say that after his Sayat Nova movie, uh, it was 1968, 1969, mm-hmm. he couldn't make movies. Government decided that his movies were out of Soviet standards frame. Mm-hmm. But he made art movie, not just a movie which wanted to see Soviet government where they uh, show the foundation of Soviet ideologies. Right. And um, Sergei Parajanov had a speech. He said that they allow this film director made because they are they show uh, how they uh, leave Soviet, um, like these kind of things. Mm-hmm. All this uh, speech was recorded. And they had a chance in 1973 to arrest him. Before his arrest, he spent four months in uh, jail, in prison. Uh, they, they tried to find the article which gave them a chance to uh, put in long time, mm-hmm. not a year or six months. They wanted to, they wanted to kill him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not physical, but they wanted to kill him. <laughs> yeah. Because Sergei Parajan was danger. He was very famous. He was a very attractive person, unique person. People who came or the, who visited Soviet Union, they wanted to meet with Sergei Parajana. Right. And again, during that meeting, he gave an interviews <laughs> which are very dangerous for him. Right. He wanted to show the environment uh, in Soviet Union, but they so it was close community, you know. Right. So you're saying the real reason he was arrested was because he was speaking against the yes, Soviet Union. Yes, against the uh, Soviet film industry. And that uh, for many years which he spent uh, with very, very dangerous peoples, with killers. But in that environment also, Sidi Prajanov started to create. Once he said that, I couldn't live without creating. Mm-hmm. And he made some collages, drawings, uh, dolls also. Dolls. We have uh, two dolls which he made in prison. Where did um, he get the material? How did he make them? Uh, especially he made using uh, free parts of magazines, journals. Wow. We have stamps which he painted on the back side of matchboxes. And uh, his prison masterpiece, Teller, we call Tellers, which he made using aluminum tops of yogurt with his fingernails. Wow. And he called tellers. And now we have a film festival, Golden Apricot. This summer we spent this film mm-hmm. festival in Armenia. The high price of the Golden Apricot uh, made using Parajan's teller. Wow. Wow. Uh, my last question. What is your favorite Parajanov movie? Is it Color of Pomegranates or another one? Of course. Of course. <laughs> The shadows of Alpha. Me too. Uh, but as I now I am a um, uh, research uh, um, researcher. Uh, but uh, do you know I like color of pomegranate very much because there I can find very 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 interesting things uh, yeah. we can imagine. Mm-hmm. Many times I told that he had uh, three uh, eyes, mm-hmm. two eyes to look world like we but uh, the third one helped him to create all these things because uh, we can imagine but we can't to release that yes we can't right. to uh, show using show on the way of uh, he could materialize he what he was alive. he yes. could alive his dreams <laughs> thank you so much Anahi this was amazing Yeah, thanks for your time. It was so nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. You too. Nice meet you. Well, that was lovely. Yeah, she was that was really insightful. There's a 13-hour time difference between here and Yerevan, so really appreciate her putting in the time. Yeah. Yeah, we're very appreciative that she was able to find the time to join us. But yeah, and one of the themes I love so much is this this connection between Parajanov and Sayanova himself. But did you notice how 
much like objects are revered in this movie. Yeah, it's all objects. It's objects. And mm. the reason for that is because he wanted it to feel as authentic as possible. So he... Um, you know, those are like real inserts of medieval manuscripts that he got permission from the government to like take and shoot. Um, all of the religious tools. Um, you know when the Catholicos dies? Yeah. He's like he's like the Pope of Armenia. That's like who that like that title. Um, like all of those th- those hats. Do you remember those hats? Yeah. There's like a sequence of those like priest hats. Yeah. Like those are all real and the canes are all real. And it's like oh, cool. he had such like such respect for these objects and antiques because his dad, Parajanov's dad, was actually an antique collector. And I think his mom did something like he he really liked hands and like handiwork because I think his mom did something. Him and Brayson. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I think of Brayson when I watch this movie because it is using cinematography in such a, it's like a cinematography movie, right? It's not a right. cinema movie. Well, right. Well, no, it's interesting the way that he kind of like cuts stuff out too because everything, all the set dressing is so deliberate oh because most of the sets are very sparse and then the objects that are there are very deliberately yes. placed. And you even have some cool stuff where like, like the sets are traced and there's just mm-hmm. black around them, which oh, is yeah. so cool. Oh yeah, when he cool. goes to the monastery. That kind of, the, the first time I saw this, that blew my mind. Yeah. So Parajanov said about this movie, I was trying to portray the art in life rather than portray life in art. Mm. So I think that's like, yeah, the art in everyday objects, yeah. which is just, it's great. Yeah. The, the, the scenes with all the rugs and stuff are so cool. The and rugs. I love just that. This is almost my favorite site, but there's the... There's the sort of uh, angel that's spinning. Yeah. And then there's the picture frame that's moving yeah, back like and clock. forth. Yeah. And just like the image of those two and the, the depth of the image. Because right. he uses depth here so well. Oh there's so many things happening on all planes. I know. So this was really inspired. This film is really inspired by Persian and Armenian miniature uh, paintings. So that's why there's that like flatness to them that's inspired by like Persian miniatures. And also the fact that Sofiko plays all like she plays the young poet and the lover is because of this tradition in Persian miniatures where like everyone looked the same. Hmm. So it's like he's literally making, recreating the art that Sayat Nova would have seen to inspire him. And it's just like... It's all, there's just so much. It reminds me of Andrei Rublev, the Tarkovsky film. I think it was a couple years before this, because again, he, Andrei Rublev was like an yes, icon painter. Yes, yes, And sort of uses that. Yeah, and thing. that, and Andrei Rublev really gave Tarkovsky grief too because of the censors, because they're like, this is too cultural of a movie, of a story right. to be truly like Soviet, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but really, if you, let's look at the prologue of this movie. Okay. So... It has it all. That's why, like, it's such a good. There's a car because... chase. There's explosions. <laughs> no, there's I mean, sex. like, it has all of the themes. Okay, you have, you have that line that's repeated. I'm a man whose life and soul are torment. I I love that line because it feels like it's almost Parajanov saying that about himself because he had such a hard life. He was imprisoned like even before the '70s on other charges of homosexuality but I again I'm not actually sure if any of them but he did have this really hard life and it's like it's this central theme you have the grapes on the stone the tablet with writing on it and that foot stepping on it Mm -hmm. and apparently that's like a symbol of poetry it's making wine out of words oh god I didn't get that at all isn't that neat (laughs) yeah and then you have obviously the religious imagery you have the fish and the bread and then the miracle of movie making, which is like multiplying those fish, right? In the one shot. Yeah. So it's like you have that. And then, of course, you have the crown of thorns. And it's really like this major theme in the movie is this this dichotomy between worldly life and spiritual life. So it's just like I feel like the prologue has it all. And then it has the side by side. The first shot of the movie is this book where it's side by side Georgian and Armenian writing. And it's like the two sides of Sayanova and of Parajanov. Mm. So it's, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful, nice little... yeah, the, the balance between the two of them is really interesting. It is. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see why he was compelled to make a story to make about this story. Yeah. And then again, this like real world versus worldliness. I love this theme. I feel like I've been looking for a really good movie about 
this and I didn't realize that this movie was about this until this time around. Mm. But I mean, it kind of is. It's like the so, OK, you know, when he goes to the monastery, when he has had his affair with the princess, apparently in real life, the legend goes that he was forced to join the church because of that scandal. But in the movie, it's kind of this this deliberate choice that he goes to like cleanse his soul. Um, but he enters the monastery. Right. And then that whole sequence is him like trying to forget the world, but he can't because He's just like, he wants to be part of the world, but then he also wants like spiritual growth and peace. So when those, when those priests are eating the pomegranates, did you notice how loud that was? Yes. No, I didn't. Yes. So it's like, (laughs) it's just very sensual. Like that whole sequence, it's those loud noises of pomegranates and he's like an outsider and he's like trying to ignore it. And then when they're washing the priest's feet, that's also really heightened when they're oh, crushing yeah. the grapes. They're making sunflower oil. It's all of these sensual things that are like reminding him of the real world. There's all those sacraments that he has to take part of. There's a there's a funeral. There's a wedding and there's a christening. And the this is actually a really cool Easter egg. The name of the guy who died. You know how the priest asks like, oh, he asks the widow who died. She says, Arutin. And then it's time for the baby's baptism. And he goes, oh, Godfather, what's the name of the baby? And the baby's name is Arutin. So Arutin is just a shorthand for Harutun. And that was actually Sayat Nova's name, like Mm. his real name. So it's like he keeps getting reminded of his life outside the church in that sequence. And then it ends with him finally like drinking wine. You know, when he sneaks that wine and it spills all over him. So it's like the world is like that wine. It's like. Wow. Worldly pleasure. Wow. And the cup, apparently a cup is like a really traditional symbol for like sexual desire and also like spiritual. A cup? Like drinking, oh. offering a drink. And now that I think about it, it is there's this really good, there's this really interesting tradition where there's one day of the year. I just realized this. It's called St. Sarkis Day and you're not supposed to eat all day. And then at night, no eating or drinking. And then at night, and girls are only supposed to do this. At night, you eat this really salty cracker. And then you have a dream that night of someone bringing you water. And the person who brings you water is the man you're going to (laughs) marry. I've never done it. I've always wanted to. My sister did it once. Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) Were the results? uh... (laughs) No, because she didn't know her fiance back then. Uh... I guess it's pretty much just who you have a crush on at the time. Right. Anyway, now that I think about what it, what if that like makes a parent sense. brings you water right? or something? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, apparently a cup is like a symbol for that. Hmm. Yeah, no, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. And then what about speaking of like sexual desire, I feel like this is this goes right along with this theme of worldliness, but like when he's when he's a kid and he has his like sexual awakening mm-hmm. looking in the bathhouse. Yeah. With that shell. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a recurring motif, that that shell, the shell over the breast. Yeah. And it's like the scene directly after that, or like a few scenes later when he's grown up and he has his kamancha, which is the instrument, the stringed instrument. He tosses like mother of pearl pieces on the instrument. Do you remember? Sort of. So like he, you have the shell right on the boob. And then when he's a young man and he has his kamancha, mm-hmm. first of all, he's like rubbing it like a breast. Right. Okay. And then he like spills pieces of mother of pearl on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) Is your mind being blown right now? It's so funny. Yeah. You can tell there's stuff. There's so much going on in this. (laughs) You know what? From an imagery perspective, this is probably maybe the most dense film that I've ever seen. It's really, I didn't realize it until I watched that video essay. And then the, you have this wonderful, like, I, I love how much you can tell that Parajanov, like, loves childhood and how important he thinks it is. Because, like, the image of Sayanova as a kid comes up throughout the movie. Like, even when his childhood is done, he pops up everywhere. Right. And it's really playful. Like, the stuff where he's a kid is super playful. Uh, like, he's swinging on a chain at one point in the monastery. Oh, my God. I didn't even talk about my favorite part, which is, like, the first part of the movie when there's that storm oh, yeah. and all the books get wet. Oh, yeah. And then they have to drain them. They have yeah. to squeeze them out. 
That was almost my favorite site. Sound? <laughs> Running water? Well, mm-hmm, you might be onto something there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then when he's imitating the horse, when he imagines St. George, like, dead. Oh, yeah. Jesus. It's like all this playful child stuff, and then he's, like, what about pretending when he gets to shot? be a horse. When he gets shot. Yeah, that too. Playful <laughs> child stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Dying multiple times. <laughs> and then he's play- his when he's at the carpet weaver's... He's like against this like weaving. God, what's the word for that? A thing? loom? Yeah, something like that. And he's he's plucking the strings like an instrument. Yeah, yeah. And you can hear the cli- the clipping of the clippers and it sounds like a clock. Yes. It's just like all this cool stuff. It really is yeah. like you're sensual. just entering what Yeah. <laughs> it, it is, is sensual. Yeah. yeah, sensual I said, yeah. Yes. Oh, I thought you said sexual. No. Oh, okay. No. Sensual. When he wipes the cross off his forehead that his dad put on him, the rooster blood. Oh my God. So many bad bird moments yeah. in this movie. Birds. The, when the, the scene where he's laying and all the birds. Chickens. Oh my God. They get I thrown can't. in and they're bleeding all over the place. I can't. And they're like flailing in the candles. I can't. It's so bad. That's rough. And then there's like a rooster just sitting on his arm at one point. With what his about- head cut off. No, no, no. Not with his head cut oh, off. Oh, I know, what you, I know what you're saying. You're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... um. What about the peacock who's like putting his beak in that guy's mouth? Oh yeah. But, eh. And then the so bad. the lambs. Yeah, the lambs are bad, but I'm just talking about birds oh, because yeah. I hate birds. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> the lamb stuff is really bad though. Yeah. At least you don't, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean all that aside, I feel like Okay, like a pomegranate is the symbol of Armenia. Mm-hmm. And the movie opens with these three pomegranates that seem to be bleeding. And then this knife. And then again in the end, At when the it's end. like his death, it's these pomegranates that are slashed open. So one of the major readings of this movie, and it's like what I thought it was about the first time I saw it, was just like the struggle of the Armenian people, which mm. is like, yes. But then in this essay, it's great because it, it pointed out that there's three pomegranates and the three countries of Transcaucasia, especially in Soviet time, they were all kind of treated as one and it was Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So it's kind of a symbol for all three, which is really interesting. And Sayat Nova was this, I hate to say it again, but symbol of like brotherhood in Transcaucasia because he's saying in all three languages. Mm. So I like how more... I, I think Parajanov's intention was more than just, I mean, obviously Armenia a lot, but the whole area yeah. depicting it and representing it. And I think that that's great, especially I, because there's so sorry, especially just because there's so much tension right now. I just wish right. that we could all just sit and watch this movie together. Yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, you know, it does foreshadow, like even when he's a young poet and he's posing with all of those like objects that inspire him down the line, one of them is this skull wearing a Persian helmet. Right. So it's like foreshadowing his death and even covers his eyes. Yeah. To it. Yeah. 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 I really, I love the way that his death is handled at the end. Yeah. It's so raising interesting. Raising the skull. Yeah. It's really interesting. Again, raising the skull with the helmet, but he doesn't, he's not shown you know, being killed. It's just like... It's very Shakespearean. Yeah. There's that moment where he goes, he travels to that church and he pours this cup, again, a cup in water, but it's empty. And then he looks up to that like Mother Mary uh, fresco. Uh And then there's that like Persian soldier who like shoots an arrow and the face falls down. So like that face has been missing and no one knows what happened to it. So it's kind of just like, I, the, it's just an interesting way of showing that like the invasion is coming i don't know it's just like little things like that how about when he's dying and that guy who's installing the those the, are the so roof cool there, yeah and he's like sing sing die. and then he's like die <laughs> yeah so th- the things that he's installing those are vases right and those were those were actually installed in churches for acoustic acoustics purposes. okay that's what i thought yeah and then they're echoing and it's other people singing his song so it's like he sings it and then other people sing it and it's just like the songs being passed down. Right. And then again, when he's, when he, he joins in that funeral, he sings a song and then they all sing it back to him. I love that moment. I think it's beautiful. And that's the only time his name is mentioned is during that funeral. Because like the way that these Ashuls, these troubadours worked, the way they would sign their song is in the last verse, they would mention their name. So, like, the only time the word Sayat Nova is said in the movie is during that song mm. because it's 
just so happens to be the last verse. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? The procession yeah. on that mountain yeah. where he's singing to them and then they sing back. Yeah. That's huh. the only time it's mentioned. Wow. Um, uh, you should watch Parajanov's other movie, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. I think you'd really like it. It's mm. it's it's like a straightforward story. It's not really like this. Very colorful, very kinetic, very yeah. It's a really cool movie. Cool. I'll it's watch hard it, to yeah. find though. Like I think it's on Mubi. There's oh, no okay. disc. I, there's a DVD, but I don't know if it's any good. I'll uh, I'll Do see if I can track it down. I I know about Mubi. I don't have a subscription. I don't but... have it either. It seems strange to it's have like... like Criterion and Mubi. Yeah, and Mubi you can only watch like thirty movies at at a time or something. It's like these are the thirty films of the month, and that's all you can watch. And I like that. It's cool, I guess. But if you don't like the curation that month, you're like, okay, well, none of yeah, these interest me. I don't yeah, know. I guess that's true. Should we do sight and sound? Yes. What was your favorite sight? Sight is pretty hard. What? Um, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have a th- four-way tie. Oh my god! <laughs> no, special shout out to these are these are honorable mentions. I like when I like the shot of the ankles washing rugs. The ankles with the yeah, I love that with the anklets on them washing the rugs. Uh-huh. I love when the nuns are presenting the different shrouds to him. Oh yeah, and they all walk in this line and they like flip it and show him and then continue yeah. what'd you think about that Th- that's a pretty obscene scene where the where he chooses the shroud from the nun in all white and she's like trying to kiss him and he's like no and then like she's grabbing him i thought it was very provocative <laughs> it is right <laughs> yeah. so uh, those are honorable mentions um favorite site will probably be the books on the roof that was very close for me it's so good yeah. it's just so so good that's one of the more literal i think uh images in the film yeah like knowledge and yes yeah religion. yeah and uh i also love just the princess in her red and black lace oh yeah classic it's just it's so good classic what are yours my well i just have one because i played by the rules <laughs> No, it is the scene where they go down and there's that mum there's that mummified body and yeah. there's a scroll yes. that they pick up and then all this like ash yeah. starts blowing around. Crazy, right? Yeah. I mean again, I could have picked so many things. No, it's, it's hard. The entire every shot in this film is like really beautiful and uh, yeah, just uh, dense and yeah. you know, painstakingly so, put together. Yeah. In that scene, there's um there's like a line of poetry read in three different languages and it's the three languages Sayatnova wrote in. Mm. So it's the same line, but it's repeated three times. Oh. Anyway, what is your favorite sound? <laughs> you got me on this one. What? It's running water. Hell yeah. <laughs> I knew it. There's so much pleasing running water in this film from like yes. the sort of the baths to like, mm-hmm. yeah, when the books all get, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's just so much. Yes. So it's the scene with the baths when he's like looking down and people are bathing and. Mm, yes. Yeah. What's your favorite sound? All right. Do you have like 10? No. (laughs) Easier to pick a a sound for this one than a sight. Only slightly. I have two. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, One of them is the sound of the books flipping in the the pages. pages. Yeah. That's like some ASMR stuff. Totally. The pomegranate eating is ASMR. Mm, that one was like a little too juicy for my taste. <laughs> um, but my real, I think my real favorite sound, the sound of the dye from the rugs hitting the like vat. And it sounds like a drum. Oh, yeah, yeah.
I like how we both picked like water themed sounds. I know. But like what a great way to show him like learning about music and sounds yeah. from his childhood. Yeah. Again, even when he's like plucking the strings on the weaving thing, it's just yeah. Yeah. Well, what does Pauline say? Nothing. I could not find a Pauline <laughs> Kale review for this. I think too the the 1982 re-release must have been kind of small, or maybe yeah. maybe she just decided to pass. Yeah. Um, because yeah, by 2013, 2014, when Scorsese did the restoration, mm-hmm. she had unfortunately, you know, was yeah. not, no longer with us. So Pauline could not find a Pauline Kale review for this one, but we do have all the fine folks on Letterbox to look forward to. So here's a couple reviews from them. <laughs> So I have a two and a half star review here. Um, I don't know what to think of this film. It's beautiful and it's poetic and it's stunning imagery, music and sound. But I guess I didn't get it. I might completely love this on rewatch or maybe after a long time. But right now I just don't get it. It feels like Andre Tarkovsky and Alejandro Jodorowsky <laughs> had sex, then did heroin. I don't get that at all. I feel like I'm doing this film such a disservice. I was pretty much in a trance for the first half of this film, but it lost me completely somehow anyway. I'll revisit eventually. So It's fair. Listen, like, I I know I'm, like, kind of biased, but I also can see that, like, it's hard to know what the fuck is going on. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, this is truly, like, I think most films, films should be designed to walk in with just sort of a basic understanding right. of the world right. and history, world right. history and stuff. And like, you should be able to get it. Right. But there are some exceptions. I think this is one of them. And exactly, that's, to- that's totally fair. These I films like can't exist. It's yeah. not really supposed to be understood. And I feel like he makes that very clear in the beginning. Yeah. I'm also just like, I don't, I, my most hated thing about a movie. And this is, oh, this is one of my favorite lines from The Souvenir Part 2. Remember when her friend sees her, the guy who's making that musical, and he goes, did you resist the need to be obvious? Yeah. <laughs> and that's literally me. I am always, like, my biggest fear is that I'm going to make, like, obvious movies. Yeah. I don't like obvious movies. So, like, but this is, like, another level of research needed yeah. to, like, fully <laughs> grasp. Yeah. Yeah. I personally loved doing the research, but I can totally understand how some people would not even want to be bothered. Right. Totally get it. It it is a piece of academic cinema. It's academic cinema yeah. for sure. Right. But Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors is not, and it's really fun. Yeah, I think you'd like one. it. Yeah. Uh I have a four and a half stars. Is this the real life? Is this just poetry? Caught in Armenia, <laughs> no escape from reality. In the beginning, there was God and Sergei Parajanov, it seems. Sayatnova is deep, very, very deep. Oh, they were calling it Sayatnova. By its original title. Yeah. I'm kind of curious why we didn't go back to its original title. Yeah, honestly, I like the color of No, I do too. It's a, great, it's a great title. It's yeah. more inviting too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, someone gave it four and a half stars. Normally, we don't say the name. This person's name on here is Penis Paolo <laughs> Pasolini. Uh, I was fortunate enough to watch this film at the ICA in London last night. This has been my second viewing and I'm still dumbfounded. What a strange piece of cinema. I felt as though I was watching a film from another planet in some ancient foreign cinematic language. And how great it feels to have so, to have so many questions. I feel like I could watch this film a hundred times and still not understand why the man had a peacock's beak in his mouth. That's true. Or why there were so many fucking sheep and headless chicken in the cathedral. (laughs) The truth is that I would hate to one day make perfect sense of these bizarre images because it is the poetic ambiguity that has me thinking about this film so much. I love that. And that's another reason why I feel so comfortable watching this movie. Both times I've seen it, I've watched it two nights back to back wow and because there's just so much you can't get sick of it because you could choose to look at a different part of the screen every time you watch it and you'll find something new people say that about a lot of films but it's absolutely true here yeah um this person just gave it a heart hot armenian men eating pomegranates and stomping on grapes what's better than this yes i watched this because of lady gaga's 911 video (laughs) no i will not be taking any questions at this time (laughs) i saw that one (laughs) Pretty funny. Well. Wait, I have a question for you, Greg. Yeah, yeah. Would you rewatch this and when? Yeah, well, this was my second time seeing it. Although, again, you know, it was for the podcast. But yeah, 
I'd give it a couple years, watch mm-hmm. it again. Hey, it's been a couple since the first time I saw it. So I think it's like a couple years kind of movie. Would you see it on a big screen? Yeah. In fact, I think that might be the way to go. That would be cool. Yeah. Because you could. that's when you could truly like live in these tableaus yes. on screen. Yes. Uh, You're going to watch this again tomorrow? I would watch it because my brother wanted to watch it. He's never seen it. If he wanted to watch it next week, I would. Nice. Just because it's like, why not? Yeah. I don't know. There's something about it. Yeah, I don't really get sick of it. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just really proud. <laughs> I think <laughs> I am. Be, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, next week we will be going. So we're staying on the Sight and Sound list. We are doing something a little bit unusual. We are, go- we are taking a film out of order. So we're plucking a film from, I think it's from 73 uh-huh. on the list. Uh-huh. Number 73. Screw the ping pong. We're screwing the ping pong for just this next week. And we're doing Nashville. I know everyone's going to be disappointed about that because everyone hates Nashville. But we're doing <laughs> Nashville next week because we had the chance to talk to a very have a very special guest on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And so instead of waiting to do this many weeks from now when we'd normally get to it. Months. Even. Months. Yeah, we decided to do it now. So next week we're doing one of my all time favorite movies. Same. I th- I think you, yeah, I was going to say you could probably say the same thing. Robert Altman's Nashville from 1975. One of the truly, truly great handful of great American films, not just from the 70s, but ever made. I think so. And uh, as someone who is a scholar of 70s American cinema, this might this is probably the peak. This is the Everest of, wow. of that. Your favorite? If I had to just pick one, maybe. Yeah. Really? I mean, Midnight Cowboys yeah. up there, but Midnight Cowboys 1969. It's still, it's part of the new Hollywood. Yeah. Um, Basically, what we're teeing up here is if you haven't seen Nashville, we need you to watch it in this next week and come back next week and listen to our episode. Because, first of all, you're welcome. We're doing you a huge favor if you haven't <laughs> seen Nashville. Because it's it's an amazing film, and it's an ensemble cast, and it's got all this great music, and it's just, it's a, it's just one of the all-time great American films. Come back next week. We'll be doing Nashville out of order, and we'll have a very special guest on to talk to us about the film. You guys are going to flip out when you find out who this guest is. (laughs) Until then, I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. Have a great week. This has been an official podcast of the Arroyo Film Club. Seen and Heard is Jacqueline Pistagian and Greg Kleinschmidt. Theme music by Andrew Cox. You can find us at seenandheardpod.com.